Bearings are found in many types of equipment in an industrial plant. So many machines have bearings that it's important to be familiar with how they work and how they need to be handled. Although you may know something about bearings in general, we're going to go into detail now about rolling contact bearings. Rolling contact bearings contain balls or rollers that move within them. They're also known as anti-friction bearings. First, we'll review some basic principles that can be applied to any type of rolling contact bearing. Then we'll get into some more advanced principles. Even though each bearing job you come across may be a little different, you'll be able to handle it by applying these principles to each situation. Let's begin now by reviewing the functions of a bearing, the names of the parts found in rolling contact bearings, and why lubrication is necessary. All bearings have three basic functions. They are to hold a moving part, to carry load, and to reduce friction. The first function of a bearing is to hold a moving part. Most often, bearings hold spinning shafts in position. Bearings allow motion to occur in one direction while resisting motion in other directions. For example, the drill you see here has bearings in it. These bearings allow the drill shaft to spin but keep the shaft from moving from side to side or back and forth. The second function is to carry load. Load is a force or a weight and a bearing must be able to support any loads placed on it. For example, the wheel bearings in a car support its entire weight. The car's weight is one type of load. In an airplane, bearings hold the propeller shaft in the engine. The force that pulls the airplane along is another type of load. Finally, a bearing must also be able to reduce friction. Now there's always a certain amount of resistance when two parts that touch move past each other. Friction is the resistance to movement between two parts. If there's too much friction or resistance, then the machine parts won't move at all and the machine won't work. Now the rolling action of the balls and rollers in the bearing help to reduce friction, like that. The parts or features of a bearing are often related in some way to these three functions. One feature that all rolling contact bearings have is rolling elements. Rolling elements may be either balls or rollers made of specially hardened steel. They turn between two hardened steel rings. These rings are also called races. Technically, the races are only those surfaces of the rings that the balls or rollers touch as the bearing turns. Remember that when you hear the word race. It will usually mean one of the rings, but it might also mean only the part of the ring that the balls or rollers touch. The balls or rollers in most bearings are held by a device called a separator. It's also called a cage or retainer. This device positions the rolling elements around the bearing so they're evenly spaced. In this way, the amount of load on each element is equalized when the bearing is turning. If it wasn't for the separator, the balls or rollers would bunch up on one side. The separator also keeps the balls or rollers from rubbing together. If this happened, friction would be increased. In some cases, it also keeps them from falling out of the bearing. This is why it's sometimes called a retainer. Other parts or features of some rolling contact bearings that you'll be seeing are shields, seals, snap rings, loading slots, and lubricant holes. However, these features aren't found on all bearings. Now, shields protect the rolling elements and fit over the open side of a bearing. They are attached to one ring of the bearing and come close to, but do not touch, the other ring. Shields keep all but very small particles of dirt out of the bearing. They are used on one or both sides of a bearing. Seals look very much like shields, except that they have a lip that rubs against the ring that rotates. Seals can also be used on one or both sides. When they are found on both sides of the ring, it's usually because the seal is holding in lubricant put into the bearing by the manufacturer. Seals keep lubricant in and virtually everything else out. 
This type of bearing is called the permanently lubricated bearing because the lubricant is expected to last for the life of the bearing. Now, some bearings may have a groove like this. A snap ring fits into this groove. Snap rings are used to hold the bearing in place in its housing. This is only one way of holding a bearing in place. We'll talk more about snap rings and other methods later on. Now another feature we mentioned was loading slots. These are slots that are sometimes cut into the bearing rings so that rolling elements, in this case balls, can be put into the bearing when it's manufactured. Not all bearings have loading slots. The last feature we're going to point out is lubricant holes. They're just what they sound like, holes that are drilled in the bearings rings to allow oil or grease to get into it. These holes are not found in all rolling contact bearings, but you should realize what they're for when you see them. Lubricant is used in all rolling contact bearings whether or not they have lubricant holes. The lubricant is usually oil or grease. There should always be enough lubricant to completely coat the rolling elements and the surfaces they come in contact with when the bearing is running. The purpose of lubricant in a bearing is to reduce friction and wear to a minimum. Although the rolling action of a rolling contact bearing produces very little friction, there is some rubbing that takes place between the balls or rollers and their retainer. Lubricant is needed to help reduce friction that's created in this way. Balls or rollers are normally covered with a film of lubricant that separates them from other bearing parts. We've covered a lot of ground here. We listed the three functions of a bearing, to hold a moving part, to carry load, and to reduce friction. Then we looked at some of the parts or features found in rolling contact bearings. We talked about the rolling elements, the rings or races, separators, shields, seals, snap rings, loading slots, and lubricant holes. Finally, we talked about lubrication in rolling contact bearings and why it's necessary. Take a few minutes now to go over this material in your text and to answer the questions you'll find there. If you have any questions on what's been covered, clear them up with your instructor. Now that we've covered the functions of a bearing and the names of its parts, we're just about ready to look at the different types of rolling contact bearings. Before beginning, however, there is one more thing that must be clearly understood. That's the types of loads or forces that bearings may have to handle. All bearings are subjected to some types of loads or forces. The way a bearing is subjected to load is through the part that it holds. For example, a shaft that has a load on it must be held in place. For this, a bearing is needed. Load is transferred through the bearing to a bearing housing. This holds the shaft and allows it to turn. There are two general types of loads, radial loads and axial loads. The difference between axial and radial loads is their direction. Radial loads on a bearing's rings tend to move the rings closer together, like this. Axial loads, on the other hand, tend to move the rings apart like this or like this. Bearings may be subjected to either radial or axial loads, or both at the same time. The kind of bearing selected is partially determined by the kind of load the designer expects it to experience. Rolling contact bearings are broken down into two major categories, ball bearings and roller bearings. Let's take a look at some ball bearings first. The major difference between the types of ball bearings is the shape of their races, the parts I'm pointing to right now, here and here. What you see here is a cross section of a shallow groove ball bearing. It's called this because the grooves or races in the inner and outer rings are shallow. This type of bearing is used to support only radial loads. If it's subjected to axial load, it's likely to break apart like this. When a small amount of axial load is anticipated, a deep groove ball bearing like the one you see here may be used. 
This bearing is intended primarily for radial loads, but the deep races allow the bearing to accept some axial load. This type of bearing is sometimes referred to as a Conrad bearing. A spherical race ball bearing is a variation of the Conrad bearing. The inner ring has a deep groove, much like the Conrad bearing, but the outer ring's race is shaped like a section of a sphere. This shape allows the bearing to handle much more misalignment than the Conrad can. Now misalignment is when one ring of the bearing is out of line with the other, like this. As long as the misalignment isn't too severe, the bearing can still work properly. The bearings we've talked about so far can handle a small axial load. When larger axial loads are expected, an angular contact bearing is often used. This type of bearing has a high shoulder on one side of the inner race and a high shoulder on the opposite side of the outer race. This design allows the bearing to handle both axial and radial loads. These bearings are often used in pairs, so they will support axial load in either direction. When they're used in pairs, the surfaces that touch are specially machined so they'll fit together. Two such bearings must always be used as a set. If one of the bearings fails, then both must be replaced. Another angular contact bearing cannot be substituted for one of the pair because then the contact surfaces wouldn't match correctly. Instead of using two angular contact ball bearings, a single bearing with two rows of balls is often used. The bearing you see here is called a double row angular contact bearing. Another type of bearing is the ball thrust bearing. This type of bearing is intended primarily for support of axial load. Instead of being one inside the other, its rings are parallel to each other. This allows the bearing to support axial load but it also means that it will not support much radial load. Now that we've discussed several types of ball bearings, let's take a look at some of the different types of roller bearings. Roller bearings are sometimes used instead of ball bearings because they'll carry more load. Rollers are bigger than balls and they can spread load over a larger area. This is why they're able to carry more load. The first type, the cylindrical roller bearing, is the one you'll probably see most often. It's primarily used to support heavy radial loads. It gets its name from the shape of its rollers. Each one is shaped like a cylinder. The second type is the tapered roller bearing. Its rollers are smaller at one end than they are at the other. In order to match the rollers, the races are also tapered. This type of bearing can handle both radial and axial loads. Another type of roller bearing has barrel shaped rollers. It is referred to either as a barrel roller bearing or a spherical roller bearing. Like the spherical ball bearing we saw a few minutes ago, its outer race is shaped like a section of a sphere. This shape allows the bearing to align itself. Barrel or spherical roller bearings are intended primarily for radial loads However, they can also handle some axial load. The next type, needle roller bearings, is similar to the cylindrical roller type, except that the rollers are much thinner. Because they're thinner, more of them can be put into a bearing. This allows them to carry heavy radial loads. Often, needle roller bearings are mounted on the shaft without an inner ring or a separator. When this happens, the rollers ride directly on the shaft so the shaft's surface must be specially hardened. Because needle rollers can carry heavy radial loads without using an inner ring, this type of bearing is often found where space around the shaft is limited. The last type of bearing we'll look at, the roller thrust bearing, is used to carry heavy axial loads. It can't handle much radial load. Like the ball thrust bearing, its rings are parallel to each other. And now that we've seen some of the common types of ball and roller bearings, here are a couple of variations that you may run into. The first is called a multiple row bearing, and it's used when axial loads in either direction must be dealt with. 
multiple row bearings can also be used when a single row of rollers might not be able to handle the load. Most roller bearings can be designed with either single or multiple rows. The second variation we mentioned is called a separable bearing. In a separable bearing, one or both of the rings may be separated from the bearing. This allows it to be installed more easily. Both categories of bearings, balls and roller bearings, can be designed in this way. Now, let's review what we've covered so far. We began by talking about different types of ball bearings. They were the shallow groove, deep groove or conrad, spherical race, angular contact, and thrust bearings. Then we looked at several types of roller bearings. They were cylindrical, tapered, barrel or spherical, needle, and thrust bearings. We also mentioned two variations on these, multiple row and separable bearings. Look at the text now and review the material on all of these different types and variations. If you have any questions, talk them over with your instructor. Bearings are precision parts and they must be installed precisely. Before you install a bearing, there are two terms you need to understand thoroughly. They are fit and tolerance. We'll show you how these terms apply to bearings and why they're important. Let's start off with bearing fit. Fit is the tightness or looseness with which parts are put together. For rolling contact bearings, the fits we're concerned with are between the inner ring and the shaft and the outer ring and the housing. There are two kinds of fits, push fit and press fit. A push fit is fairly loose and gets its name from the fact that the ring can usually be pushed into place by hand. Now, a press fit is much tighter than a push fit and gets its name because a lot of force is needed to press the ring in place. A press fit is also called an interference fit or a shrink fit. In most cases, rolling contact bearings have a push fit on one ring and a press fit on the other. The general rule is that the rotating ring gets the press fit. Which ring rotates depends on how the bearing is used. Usually the inner ring rotates. However, there are exceptions to this. For example, in the bearing on a car wheel, the outer ring rotates. Rotating inner rings are what you'll usually find, though. So, let's talk now about the press fit between an inner ring and its shaft. In order for the ring to fit tightly on the shaft, its inside diameter, this distance, must be slightly smaller than the outside diameter of the shaft, this distance. We've exaggerated the difference in size here. When the ring is installed, it must be expanded to fit over the shaft. One way this is done is by heating the bearing so that it expands. The bearing can then be slipped onto its shaft. A press fit results as the inner ring on the bearing cools down and contracts. When press fitting an outer ring, the situation is reversed. In order for the ring to fit tightly within the housing, its outside diameter, this distance, must be slightly greater than the inside diameter of the housing, this distance. When the ring is installed, it must be compressed to fit within the housing. One way this is done is by cooling the bearing so that it contracts. The bearing can then be slipped into the housing. A press fit results as the bearing's outer ring heats up and expands. The amount of difference between the diameters we're talking about is very, very small. In most of the bearings you'll work with, the difference will be on the order of one thousandth of an inch or about twenty-five thousandth of a millimeter. One thousandth of an inch is sometimes called a mill. When a precise amount of difference between the diameters is required, this information will be given in the manufacturer's instruction manual. At this point, you should know enough about bearing fits to be able to understand the specifications. For example, if the manual describes the inner race fit to the shaft as a fit that is one mil tight, you should realize that this is a press fit. It means that the inner ring diameter 
is one thousandth of an inch smaller than the diameter of the shaft. As we said, press fit requires a lot of effort. Push fits, on the other hand, are easier. If an inner ring was to be installed with a push fit, it would be slightly larger than its shaft and would slip into place fairly easily. Again, we've exaggerated the sizes. If an outer ring was installed with a push fit, it would be slightly smaller than its housing and would also be easy to install. Now we've seen what bearing fit is. The reason we've talked so much about it is because improper fit can lead to early bearing failure. There are two ways this might happen. The fit may be too loose or it may be too tight. A fit that is too loose is a problem because it allows the bearing rings to slip around the shaft or housing. This is known as creeping and is a particular problem for the rotating ring. If the fit on a rotating ring is too loose, it tends to slip or creep on the shaft. This causes damage. You can see how this happens in the bearing shown here. In this bearing, the shaft rotates and the inner ring is pressed on the shaft. If the fit is right, the inner ring and the shaft turn together. If, however, the fit is loose, the shaft slips within the inner ring and rubs against it. This rubbing causes rapid wear and damages both the inner ring and the shaft. On this bearing, the push fit ring, which is the outer ring, is slightly loose in its housing. It can be expected to rotate just a little. Slight creeping of the push fit ring is normal but the fit must not be so loose that the ring bangs around. If the fit is so loose that the ring is free to bang around, it will cause rapid wear between the outer ring and the housing. This will lead to bearing failure. One sign of excessively loose fit is scratches. Scratches that run around the ring and the shaft or housing indicate loose fit. These scratches are the wear marks caused by rubbing. Bearing fits can also be too tight. A fit that is too tight can result in increased friction, high operating temperatures, or broken rings. Manufacturers of bearings leave a little extra room between the rings. Some of this extra room is used up by a press fit. If the fit is too tight, all of the extra room is used up and the balls or rollers will be squeezed between the rings. This eliminates the bearings clearances and prevents film lubrication from forming. Without proper lubrication, Friction increases, causing high operating temperatures. Installing a ring with too tight a fit can also cause it to crack. If too much pressure is put on the ring to get it in place, the metal will actually break apart. Bearings, shafts, and housings are manufactured very precisely. Unfortunately, it's not possible to manufacture any machine part with perfect accuracy. As a result, bearings, shafts, and housings are manufactured so that their sizes fall within certain ranges. These ranges are called tolerances. We're going to talk about two different kinds, manufacturing tolerances and fit tolerances. A manufacturing tolerance for a bearing is the amount of leeway the manufacturer allows in the size of the bearing. Generally, the manufacturing tolerance for bearings depends on two things, the size of the bearing and its use. As a rule, large bearings have larger tolerances than small bearings. This is not always true, however. Uh, certain bearings must be manufactured with extreme precision because of the way they're going to be used. Then the tolerance is smaller, regardless of the size of the bearing. Manufacturing to tolerances for bearings are usually a few ten thousandths of an inch or a few thousandths of a millimeter. The shafts and housings used with these bearings are manufactured to similar tolerances. Because how tightly or loosely parts fit together is so important, manufacturers sometimes specify just how much leeway in fit there can be. Fit tolerance is the amount of tightness or looseness that's acceptable. Sometimes it's necessary to measure parts before assembling them in order to make sure that the fit will be correct. This is because the sizes of the parts can vary due to manufacturing tolerances. For example, if a bearing was to be mounted on a shaft, the bearing's inside diameter is measured. Then the outside diameter of the shaft is measured. The difference between these measurements is the fit. Often, the manufacturer's instructions will give a range of tightness or looseness for fit. 
As we said, this is called the fit tolerance. The measured fit must fall within this range. This ensures that the parts will fit correctly. Now you've seen what is meant by fit, and you should understand the difference between push and press fits. We covered some of the ways improper fit can cause a bearing to fail earlier than it should. Keep in mind that a bearing can fail whether the fit is too loose or too tight. We also covered tolerances and why they are necessary. Two types of tolerances that are important in bearing work are manufacturing tolerance and fit tolerance. Take some time now to go over this material in your text and make sure you understand it. Earlier we mentioned that bearings hold moving parts in position. Most of the rolling contact bearings that you'll find around the plant hold spinning shafts in position. What we'll be concerned with now is how bearings fit onto shafts. The inner ring is the part of the bearing that fits onto a shaft. In most bearings, the inner ring is the one that rotates. Because this is the most common situation, we're going to concentrate on some mounting methods for bearings whose inner rings rotate. Before we look at these different mounting methods, let's consider what an inner ring mounting is expected to do. Basically, there are two requirements. First, the mounting should keep the shaft from turning inside the inner ring. The shaft and the inner ring must turn together. Second, the mounting must keep the shaft from sliding through the inner ring. We'll discuss commonly used types of mountings, the kind you're most likely to see around the plant. They are the lock washer lock nut mounting, the end plate mounting, the eccentric cam mounting, the tapered sleeve mounting, and mounting without an inner ring. For each of these methods, we'll see what the mounting looks like, how it secures the bearings inner ring, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. The first of these mounting methods is the lock washer lock nut mounting. Like other types of mountings, it keeps the shaft from sliding through the bearing. The shaft is kept from sliding in one direction by a shoulder. A shoulder is a place on the shaft where the shaft size changes so that a bearing can be placed against it. The inner ring of the bearing is press fit on the shaft to prevent creeping. On the other side of the bearing, there's a lock washer and lock nut. These keep it from sliding in the opposite direction. The lock washer has a tab that fits into a slot in the shaft. This tab prevents the lock washer from slipping around the shaft. The other tabs on the lock washer can be bent to fit into slots in the lock nut to prevent the lock nut from loosening. The lock nut's main purpose is to keep the shaft from sliding through the inner ring. However, because the lock nut clamps the inner ring against the shoulder of the shaft, it also helps to keep the inner ring from creeping. An advantage of this type of mounting is that it's fairly easy to remove and replace the bearing. In order to reach the bearing, all you have to do is remove the lock nut and lock washer. It also has a disadvantage. The disadvantage of this method is that the press fit of the inner ring on the shaft must be just right, or the bearing won't work correctly. Although the lock washer and the lock nut help to prevent creeping, this method mainly depends on the press fit to keep the shaft from turning within the inner ring. In spite of this, the lock washer lock nut mounting has proven to be reliable in a wide variety of uses, and it's found in many different kinds of machines. The end plate mounting is the second type we'll look at. This type is used when it's desirable or necessary for a bearing to be mounted on the very end of a shaft. On one side, the bearing's held in place by a shaft shoulder. The inner ring of the bearing is press fit on the shaft to prevent creeping. An end plate holds it in place on the other side. This end plate is held to the shaft by locking bolts that screw into the end of the shaft. Like the lock washer lock nut mounting, the end plate mounting is fairly easy to remove. However, it also has the same disadvantage. It depends on the press fit to keep the shaft from turning within the inner ring. Another disadvantage is that it can't be used on small shafts. 
Holes must be drilled in the end of the shaft for the locking bolts. This would reduce the strength of a small shaft so much that it could break. The next type of mounting is called an eccentric cam mounting. This one is different from the others we've talked about because it doesn't depend on a press fit to keep it in place. In a mounting like this, the bearing's inner ring is wider than usual. One end of the inner ring has a circular projection that is slightly off-center from the rest of the bearing. We've exaggerated it here. This is called an eccentric cam. A locking collar fits over this cam, and the shape of these pieces causes the inner ring to be squeezed against the shaft when the locking collar is turned. This pressure holds the inner ring in place without a press fit. To mount the bearing, the shaft is slipped into the bearing. Then the locking collar is slipped over the shaft and on to the eccentric cam. The locking collar must be turned in the direction that the shaft will rotate. It's tightened by wrapping it sharply with a hammer. This locks the inner ring to the shaft. The locking collar is further secured to the shaft with a set screw. The main advantage of the eccentric cam mounting is that it doesn't require a press fit between the inner ring and its shaft, and so it's even easier to remove or replace the bearing also, the fit between the inner ring and the shaft is less critical than it is in other types. Its main disadvantage is that it doesn't hold the bearing as tightly as other types of mountings. For this reason, it's only used to hold bearings that are subjected to light loads. The next type of mounting we'll talk about is the tapered sleeve mounting. In this method, the inner race of the bearing is not mounted directly on the shaft. Instead, a slightly tapered split metal sleeve is first placed on the shaft. Then the bearing is slipped over the sleeve. The inner ring of a bearing must have a matching taper so that it will make full contact with the sleeve. The bearing and matching sleeve are secured to the shaft by a lock nut and lock washer. As the lock nut is tightened, it drives the bearing up the tapered sleeve. This causes the sleeve to tighten down on the shaft. The tapered sleeve mounting has the advantage of being easy to install since the bearing doesn't have to be fit on the shaft. First, the shaft and the sleeve are lubricated. Then the tapered sleeve is slipped onto the shaft. The bearing fits easily over the tapered sleeve. After the lock washer is installed, the lock nut forces the bearing into position. The lock washer tab is then bent to engage the lock nut and hold it in place. A tapered sleeve bearing does have several disadvantages, however. First, the lock nut must be tightened very carefully. If it's over tightened, the bearing's inner ring may be stretched so much that it breaks. If it's not tightened enough, the bearing won't be held securely in place. The amount that the lock nut is tightened is critical because it determines the tightness of the fit to the shaft. In fact, the amount the lock nut is to be tightened will often be specified by the manufacturer. This specification may be either in terms of torque on the lock nut or as the number of turns that the lock nut is tightened. Second, even when the lock nut is tightened properly, this type of mounting won't always prevent the sleeve and bearing from sliding along the shaft. If the bearing is subjected to axial loads, both the bearing and the sleeve may slide unless the sleeve is further secured by other means, such as a shoulder on the shaft. Third, because the bearing moves along the sleeve when the lock nut is tightened, it's difficult to know where it will end up on the shaft. When the position of the bearing on the shaft is critical, a different type of mounting is generally used. The last type of mounting we'll discuss is a mounting without an inner ring. We'll show this type of mounting with a needle roller bearing. Here, the outer ring and rolling elements slip over the shaft. The rollers are in direct contact with the shaft, which acts as the inner ring of the bearing. Unlike the other mounting methods we talked about, this one does not prevent the shaft from sliding through the bearing. The advantage of this kind of mounting is that it's possible to eliminate the inner ring without losing load-carrying ability. 
so it's often used when there's not much space around the shaft. The disadvantage of this type of mounting is that a standard shaft can't be used because the rolling elements would wear it away. To prevent this kind of damage, a specially hardened shaft must be used. Now we've discussed several types of inner ring mountings. They were the lock washer lock nut mounting, the end plate mounting, the tapered sleeve mounting, and mounting without an inner ring. For each of these types, we've seen what the mounting looks like, how the shaft is secured to the bearing, and the advantages and disadvantages of each type. Remember that although the inner ring mountings you've seen are fairly common, they're not the only ones that are used. There are almost as many different types of mountings as there are different types of bearings. Our discussion should have given you a general idea of what an inner ring mounting does and a better understanding of the types used in your plant. Before we go on, take a few minutes to go over this material in your text and make sure that you understand it. We just saw how bearings hold shafts. Now let's take a look at the part that holds the bearing, the housing. The housing surrounds the bearing and holds it in place. In order to do this, the housing must be able to handle the types of loads the bearing is subjected to. All housings support loads. Usually, the load is transferred from the shaft to the bearing to the housing. Most housings contain lubricant for the bearing. Housings also keep dirt out of the bearing. First, we'll look at some different types of housings and ways that housings hold bearings. Then we'll look at shaft seals. Bearing housings can be divided into two types, pillow block housings or built-in housings. Pillow block housings are always separate from the machine casing. Built-in housings are part of the machine's casing. Let's take a look at the pillow block housing first. The main purpose of any housing is to support the bearing it contains. Pillow block housings are located outside the machine casing and are separated from it. The shaft can usually be seen between the housing and the casing. Some pillow blocks hold the end of the shaft. In others, the shaft passes clear through them. Pillow block housings may be either solid or split. They come apart in different ways. Some solid housings have a removable cover. When you remove the cover, you can see the bearing. Once the cover's been removed, the housing can be moved out of the way, and then the bearing can be taken off the shaft. Split housings come apart differently. In a split housing, the top can be taken off. The shaft and bearing can then be lifted out so that the bearing can be taken off. The second type of housings, the built-in housing, is actually part of its machine casing. In many machines that have built-in housings, the shaft and bearings can't be seen at all because they are completely contained within the machine casing. To get at them, the casing must be taken apart. Like pillow block housings, built-in housings may be solid or split. Solid housings usually have end caps. Removing the end caps allows the bearing and shaft to be taken out of the machine so the bearing can be worked on. In a split housing, there is a joint in the machine's casing that must be taken apart to get to the bearing. This allows the shaft and bearing to be lifted out so the bearing can be worked on. Now that we've seen some of the different kinds of housings, let's take a look at some of the ways housings hold bearings. Bearing housings can be built to either completely prevent axial movement or to allow a small amount. A housing that's built to allow a small amount of axial movement is said to have a free or floating bearing. The housing for a floating bearing looks like this. There's space for a small amount of movement in an axial direction. If the housing prevents all axial movement, its bearing is fixed. Both of these types of housings may be found in the same machine. A single shaft usually has two or three or more bearings along its length. Usually just one of these bearings prevents axial movement. This is the fixed bearing. Any others are usually floating bearings. A floating bearing will only support radial load. The main reason that it is floating is to allow the shaft to expand when it gets hot. 
Machines usually create heat when they run. This causes the shaft to expand. If a bearing is free to move, shaft expansion does not place any extra load on the bearings. If, on the other hand, the two bearings on the same shaft were fixed, shaft expansion would put extra load on them. This would cause the shaft to bow or the bearings to fail. Now, let's take a closer look at fixed bearings. Now, fixed bearings don't move because their outer ring is held in place in its housing. There are a variety of ways to fix a bearing's outer ring in its housing. One way is to use a bearing housing that has no room for the bearing's outer ring to move in an axial direction. This is the type that we saw earlier. In this kind of housing, solid spacers can be placed in the housing to keep the bearing from moving. Another way a bearing can be fixed in place is by a snap ring like this one. that fits around the outer ring of the bearing in a slot. When the bearing is installed, the snap ring holds the bearing in place. Snap rings are capable of resisting considerable amounts of axial load. The last method we're going to talk about is using a set screw. The set screw engages the bearing's outer ring and prevents it from moving. This method also prevents the outer ring from rotating. These methods of fixing a bearing's outer ring are some of the more common ones, but there are many other methods that are often used. The next thing we're going to talk about is how the space between the shaft and the housing is sealed. All housings have shaft openings. Most bearing housings have shaft seals to keep lubricant from leaking out around the shaft. They also keep dirt or other contaminants from getting in. We'll look at two different types of shaft seals and describe how they work. There are two basic kinds, contact seals and labyrinth seals. Contact seals surround the shaft and rub against it. They're made of a soft material like rubber. The seal is attached to the bearing housing and it closes any space between the shaft and the housing. When the shaft is in motion, it turns within the seal. A contact seal must be made of a soft material so it doesn't damage the shaft. The soft material does wear away after a while, but it's much easier and cheaper to replace a seal than a shaft. A labyrinth seal works differently from a contact seal. First of all, it's made of two rings that fit together when they're installed. One ring is mounted on the shaft and the other is attached to or is part of the housing. The rings have ridges that interlace with each other. It works by forcing any leakage to travel through a long, narrow, bending passage. This design reduces leakage to a minimum. The shape of this passage is something like a labyrinth or a maze. That's where the name comes from. Although the parts of a labyrinth seal don't rub together, it does have a moving part. If pieces of dirt get between the parts, they become worn. If a seal is damaged in this way, it will leak excessively and must be replaced. Now you should understand the difference between the types of bearing housings that we discussed. You should know what the difference is between fixed and floating bearings and how a fixed bearing's outer ring is held in place. You should also understand how contact seals and labyrinth seals work. Before we go on, take a few minutes to review this material in your text and to answer the questions you'll find there. If you have any questions, clear them up with your instructor. We've already mentioned that lubrication is needed to reduce friction and wear in bearings. They're usually lubricated with either oil or grease, so we're going to cover both, some oil lubrication methods and several ways of greasing a bearing. All of the methods are designed to maintain a certain amount of lubricant in the bearing. Your plant probably keeps records that show when such maintenance work was done last and specific information about particular bearings, like whether they're permanently sealed or not. Be sure to check these records before beginning work so that bearings won't be lubricated unless they need it. Let's begin by examining some of the different ways of oiling a bearing. The ones we'll cover are the constant level oiler, the oil bath, uh, force circulation, splash feed, and drip feed. 
Although there are several types of lubrication systems, most of the oilers you'll see in the plant will be like the ones we'll see or very similar to them. Most systems are designed to maintain an oil level that's about halfway up the lowest element in the rolling contact bearing. The first type we'll look at, the constant level oiler, has an oil cup that's connected by a tube to the housing. The oil level in the cup is the same as the oil level in the housing because of the tube that connects them. A reservoir that has an opening in its bottom is placed in the oil cup. As long as the reservoir has oil in it, the system will automatically maintain the proper oil level within the bearing housing. This is how it works. When the level of oil in the housing drops, oil starts to flow through the tube into the housing. This causes the level in the oil cup to drop. The oil continues to flow until the levels in the cup and the housing are the same. When the level in the oil cup falls below the opening in the bottom of the reservoir, oil flows from the reservoir into the oil cup. This flow stops as soon as the level in the oil cup is up to the bottom of the reservoir. At this point, the oil in the housing is back to its proper level. The reservoir in this type of oiler is transparent so that its level can be checked. It's refilled by lifting it off the tube turning it upside down and pouring oil into it. Another common type of lubricator is the oil bath system. In this type, there is a reservoir inside the housing. There's usually a sight glass mounted on the side of the housing that the operator can use to check the oil level. If oil is needed, it's added through a fill hole on the top of the housing. Like other housings that contain oil, there's usually a drain plug located at the bottom. And periodically, the plug is removed so that oil can be drained and replaced. Some oil bath systems don't have a sight glass or other outside indicators. Instead, there might be a dipstick that fits inside the fill hole. The dipstick is used to check the level of oil in the reservoir. The third type we'll cover is the forced circulation system. A forced circulation system continually circulates a steady supply of oil through the bearing. In this type of system, there's a pump that pushes oil to the bearing. Then it's usually collected in a reservoir so it can be pumped through again. Oil filters and coolers are often used in a forced circulation system to keep the oil clean and cool. The filters remove dirt from the circulating oil. Coolers are used to remove heat that the oil picks up from the bearing. So this type of system really accomplishes two things. It keeps the bearing well lubricated and it keeps the oil clean and cool. Another type you'll see is the splash feed oiler. A splash feed lubrication system is a type in which oil is splashed onto the bearing. Splash feed systems are usually found in components like gearboxes. Enough oil is poured into the box to cover the bottom of the gears. When the gears rotate, oil is thrown all over the inside of the box. This lubricates both the gears and the bearings. If the gears spin fast enough, they create an oil mist that completely fills the box. The last type of lubricator we'll look at is the drip feed type. Drip feed lubricators are systems that allow the oil to drip slowly into the bearing. In this type of oiler, there is a transparent reservoir that's set above the bearing. The reservoir has a small hole in the bottom that the oil drips through. This keeps the bearing steadily supplied with fresh oil. There is a knob at the top of the reservoir that is used to adjust the rate of the drip. The proper rate can be determined by either referring to the operating manual or asking your supervisor. There is also a lever that is used to stop the flow of oil when maintenance is required or when the machine is shut down. Generally, new oil is added by pouring it into the top of the reservoir until the reservoir is full. Now that we've seen some ways of feeding oil to a bearing, let's talk about some methods for getting grease into a bearing. We're going to cover three methods. Packing by hand, greasing with a grease gun, and using a grease cup. These methods are only used with bearings that do not have seals. Sealed bearings are permanently lubricated and must not be greased. To pack by hand, the housing must be removed or pushed out of the way. 
Then the bearing is usually removed from the shaft in order to make the job easier. The next step is to clean the bearing in solvent. Then it's held in the hand while grease is pressed in between the rolling elements. The grease must be distributed evenly throughout the bearing. The bearing should be packed one-third to one-half full. Now, carefully estimate how much grease to add. If you think too much grease has been added, rotate the bearing slowly to force out the excess. It's also possible to hand pack a bearing that's still mounted on the shaft, but it's more difficult because it's awkward. Removing and reinstalling a bearing just to grease it takes a lot of time. There's also a chance that it might be damaged during the process. Usually, it isn't necessary to grease bearings by hand because their housings have grease fittings. A grease fitting is a small rounded projection from the housing that has a hole through it. If the housing has a grease fitting, then grease is applied with a grease gun. The fitting on the grease gun must match the fitting on the housing. To grease the bearing from a fitting, it is often necessary to remove a drain plug from the housing. Before any grease is added, remove the drain plug, if there is one, so that old grease or excess grease can drain out. Wipe off the grease fitting and make sure the opening is clear. Then attach the gun to the fitting on the housing. Applying the grease while the bearing's in motion helps to distribute the grease more evenly. Grease is slowly added until it begins to come out of the drain. Run the machine for several minutes afterward to make sure that all the excess grease has been forced out of the bearing. Then wipe off any excess grease and replace the plug. If there isn't a drain plug, then excess grease or old grease leaves the bearing through the shaft seals. It's very important to add new grease to the housing very slowly then. Otherwise, the shaft seals could be damaged. A good rule of thumb is to pump the grease gun no more than three times. Your plant may have guidelines on how much grease to add. If so, be sure to follow them. Another method of greasing a bearing is to use a grease cup. A grease cup is a container with grease in it that's mounted right on the housing. To force grease into the bearing, turn the top of the cup. Usually, it's turned once or twice each time greasing is required. Again, your plant might have specific guidelines on how much and how often a grease cup should be operated. Ask about this before you start. Also, be sure there's enough grease in the cup before you begin. If it's nearly empty, refill it with the right type of grease. Now, let's review what we've seen in this segment. We covered five ways of oiling rolling contact bearings. Uh, they were the constant level oiler, oil bath, uh, force circulation, splash feed, and drip feed methods. Remember that the proper oil level in most rolling contact bearings is halfway up the lowest rolling element. Then we covered three ways of greasing a bearing. They were packing by hand, uh, greasing with a grease gun, and using a grease cup. You should understand how each of these methods is used. That completes our look at rolling contact bearings. We've reviewed the function of a bearing and examined in detail the components of several types of rolling contact bearings, their housings and how they function, various types of inner ring mountings and their characteristics, and some common lubrication systems and how they work. Take some time now to go over this material in your text. Then, if you have any questions, clear them up with your instructor.